Hello guys and welcome back to Relevant Founders, brought to you by Relevant Software. Relevant is an international software development company that designs, builds and delivers world-class standard products for Fortune 500 companies and promising startups. Today with me, I've got the co-founder of VizGen, Young He. Young, how are you? Yeah, thanks. I'm doing very well. How are you? Good, good. Thank you very, very well today. The sun was shining a little bit ago, but now not so much, but all good. Um, what I want to do before we get start talking about VizGen, so much to get through, but I want to get to know you a little bit better. I've seen some videos of yours out there, and there was a really interesting one on your like graduation speech at Harvard. Um, just tell the listeners for me, maybe something that um, not many people know about you, just to get to know you a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Uh, I can do a brief introduction of myself. So, uh, currently, I serve as uh, the Senior Director of Scientific Affairs within Western and also one of the scientific co-founders. And proud to actually start in Western, I did my PhD uh, in Shall We Drawn Lab at Harvard University. And uh, back then, I was focusing a lot on uh, developing new imaging technologies and mm -hmm. applying them to study different kind of biology questions. Uh, and then after finishing my PhD, I moved to MIT. Uh, for my postdoc work, and at the time I uh, worked a lot on cancer diagnostics. Um, so as you sort of hinted at, um, so I, I did a commencement uh, speech at Harvard back around 2016, and um, I shared a bit of my grow up story. Uh, I uh, grew up in uh, rural China, a place where uh, actually back in the 1980s, there was not too much uh, modern facilities or electricity or cars were not really available. and um, Modern medicine back then was not widely available for most of the rural societies, and that was one of the reasons I actually sort of concentrated in biology and uh, later uh, went to the US for graduate school and basically to sort of focus and, and learn and pick up all those biotech or bi medical skills as a knowledge so that my, my hope is that it could really help to um, improve the lives of those people who live in the countryside. Um, mm -hmm. so. So would you say this was kind of a goal you've had pretty much your whole life to do what you're doing now? Uh, pretty much, yes. Wow, uh -huh. very nice. You, you don't find that often, you know, when people have the goal from really young ages and bringing it into, into life is amazing. Um, tell me, let's get straight to it. Tell me a little bit about, not a little bit, tell me all about this, Jen. Let's start with where did the idea come from? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, I can give a brief background of uh, what Wisdom does and then sort of share the story of how uh, the idea and how, how basically we sort of decided to uh, commercialize the technology. So uh, Wisdom is a life science company um, actually uh, localized in Boston, uh, in Massachusetts, and we pioneer in uh, single cell spatial genomics technologies. Um, so we have a platform called Merscope on the market now uh, that enables massively multiplexed and genome scale uh, nucleus acid imaging with extremely high accuracy and sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, perhaps I can share a bit of like why we believe this is such an important field and mm -hmm. uh, why there's a huge demand that, and that could sort of tell like why uh, we decided to fund this company. So um, briefly as you can imagine, uh, biological systems are very, very complex and made of many cells uh, in a body or, um, that are organized in 3D. Uh, for example, like just take the human body, as example, we have trillions of trillions of cells, uh, very intricately organized in each organ. Um, and the morphology of each cell, the location, how they interact, um, are also are all very critical to the function of um, the tissue or the organ. Um, so in the past, genomic analysis, probably you have heard of sequencing, um, can really help inform, for example, the molecular and cellular composition of each cell, uh, but it can only show a tiny bit of that. It can only show parts. It is very difficult, for example, to use a laser swab, um, like we do in we testing uh, nowadays, to infer where individual cells are uh, are coming from from um, the, the tissue, right? So on the other hand, there is another camp of technology that I think uh, many of us are also very familiar with, which is the pathological analysis that we often see in a hospital setting. They can tell where the cells are coming from in each tissue, even at a single cell level. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the big limitations is that uh, the number of biomarkers that you can analyze through those um, uh, pathological analysis is very, very limited, often uh, less than four. Uh, so you, uh, as you kind of see the background here, then uh, with these two very powerful technologies that are quite avail readily available in our uh, life, there are two, uh, there is a really huge technology gap there, um, and neither of them is perfect. Um, 
just mm -hmm. to put the drive down the message, like genomic sequencing can analyze many, many biomarkers, but it really doesn't provide any special context. Uh, while pathological analysis tells you where things are, but it can only an analyze a few biomarkers or biomolecules. Um, and this is really the aha moment where when we decided that, this, that there is a huge market um, need here. And then back in 2015, when um, yeah, I was still in the graduate uh, school, the lab, shall we draw lab, they developed a technology called uh, Murfish. Um, and that technology can sort of image hundreds to thousands of different RNA molecules um, at the same time with extremely high sensitivity and mm -hmm. uh, accuracy. So it kind of makes sense for us to think that, oh, wow, this is the technology that can help address these kind of questions in biological, re biological research. Uh, and with that thought in mind, and that's how um, we basically started back in 2018, we started the efforts of commercializing and then founded the company uh, around 2019. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's kind of the story behind, uh, quite long story behind it. Yeah. We'll go on to it in a little bit um, about Murfish, Murfish and uh, Merskull as well, because I, I would like you to explain these a little bit more in detail for our listeners. Um, but talk to me about the challenge of um, starting up your business, obviously in 2018, 2019, then 2020 came. Um, COVID obviously made things a lot more difficult or did it make um, things even more invested, people more interested in what you were doing when COVID came? Yeah, COVID was definitely, I'd say, one of the uh, big concerns when we started. Um, it, the company was founded actually at the end of 2019. And then when we uh, started building the team for less than half a year, then COVID hit and then uh, many states in the US has to sort of under strict knockdown. Um, so we, as we started really working together and building the team, um, and as you can imagine, as a company that is building life science tools, we do require a lot of people to work on site. So basically, how to work and balance, basically, and manage the team to work remotely, how to mitigate the risks of certain, not only supply chain issues, but also um, um, sort of on site versus um, the uh, remote working and create work environment that everyone feels comfortable uh, if they have to come on site and all those uh, were, were the concerns that made things definitely more complicated than pre-pandemic time. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I, people are a lot more, I mean, compared to now, people are a lot more relaxed. We've had the vaccines and stuff, but then it was a time where people were very worried of being anywhere near people. Um, okay, tell me, let's go right back to the beginning slightly. So tell me a little bit more about your original MVP. Yes, so uh, for our technology, um, you can see this is sort of a technology to directly see and visualize the genes. And particularly, we are RNA imaging complex. We, we focus on imaging the transcriptome inside a cell, basically the gene expression profile of individual cells. Uh, and to sort of develop a minimally uh, viable product, one of the things that we need to focus on is sort of what are kind of features um, are needed in order for the customers who will be using the, this tool for the research, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for us, this is a high cell throughput and high flex imaging platform for uh, spatial genomics measurements. Uh, briefly, by the time when we, we sort of started to design the features, we decided that it needs to be able to scale up to hundreds to even thousands of genes uh, with, we, we, in, in our term, we call it single molecule sensitivity and down to uh, 100 nanometer resolution. And it also has to scan very big tissue area because we are scanning the tissue. So the couple of design criteria that we put um, forward in developing the first generation of products, uh, the first one is that it has to be high throughput and high flex, uh, so that researchers can really gather more biological information uh, from analyzing the biological samples. Mm. Uh, the second one is that it has to be extremely sensitive and high resolution, uh, so that the users can see the biomolecules, uh, including genes that are very rarely expressed in tissue uh, within each individual cell, and then it also has to be quantitative um, because genomics research oftentimes it started with that mindset that I, I can quantify things right um, so uh, researchers can sort of not only see what they're seeing uh, but also do comparisons between different biological specimens and uh, and I, I think the final design criteria for putting the MVP is really it has to be user friendly because uh, we have seen how different researchers they previously struggle to put together instrument on their own because they are many factors need to be taken into consideration to make this platform work. And for us, we wanted to sort of build a platform or an instrument that any novice user without any prior knowledge or training, uh, they can actually operate on this machine with just one single training. And 
that's what we also ended up delivering uh, in the end as well. How did you manage to do that? Because obviously that's a very, very difficult task. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, definitely it's um it's a complicated procedure, and um one of the very fortunate things about uh, our technology is that um it has come out in the field and uh, very well validated for quite some time. Uh, the initial description or the invention of the technology was uh, published in a scientific journal of science back in 2015. Uh, and since then, there has been many iterations of the technology in the lab uh, where the technology was developed. And then we improved upon that. So from there, then sort of uh, delivering all that, we have all the specs that we need to know what is a true high throughput and high sensitivity and high resolution instrument, right? And, and that really made things uh, quite straightforward. And at the same time, we also, in order to really build the product as well as the reagent that uh, goes around it. Um, so this is the instrument plus reagent uh, life science platform. So not only you need the instrument to process and, and image the samples, but you also need the necessary reagent to kind of uh, process all the samples on a bench. So what's really fortunate for us is that the chemistry side is also uh, more or less validated and very rigorously tested in a laboratory setting previously. Before we, we move on, so talking about your MVP there, that's a lot of work uh, to do uh, on your MVP right at the beginning. How did you manage doing this? Did you have to outsource a team at the beginning or did you manage to do it all in-house? Uh, we indeed outsourced um, part of the work, um, and one of the reasons is really to accelerate the development process for this product, um, because there, not only there are many companies around that are specialized in developing and actually finalizing this type of uh, life science tools, uh, but at the same time, by outsourcing, we can also just focus on the sort of the things that we, the, the many other parts that we need to prioritize, right? So it's more of a resource allocation uh, when we start it. So indeed, we outsourced. When you did outsource, obviously what you're doing is very niche, very specific. How did you find the engineering experts to do what you wanted to do, but also have the knowledge in what you're doing, scientifically to a, to a certain extent? Yeah, I think one, one of the very first things that when we started the company um, was that we began to look for um, contract manufacturing and outsourcing companies um, in the beginning to really establish the partnership and uh, this is indeed, as you mentioned, uh, quite a long process and we need to find the right partners, right? Um, and uh, essentially we need to find companies that have deep know-how and experience in designing, uh, developing, as well as manufacturing this type of um, instruments. Mm -hmm. um, and since this is some um, sort of high resolution microscope based uh, instrument, so it does require, for example, the um, contracting company to have quite a lot of experience in the hardware engineering, the software engineering, the optics um, and electrical engineering as well. So it's not easy to find mm. all in one and it does take us quite a lot of time to uh, sort of look for the right partner and then in the end, um, actually uh, sort of uh, decide the, the final one to work. And I, I think another factor that we were considering when we were um, looking for the partners was that we also need then to have a sort of a scalable and sustainable infrastructure um, so that we can easily scale up our production when we finalize and finish the design. And that's also another factor mm. that uh, was in our consideration when we um, started this effort. When, when you were doing this, where did you find was kind of the best area, location worldwide? I guess you were looking worldwide when you were looking at outsourcing or did you stay stateside? And what was your reason for choosing that area? Because what I'm guessing is maybe some areas are better at understanding um, what you're doing better. Maybe they're more advanced, more ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah, we mainly focused, um, I'd say in the US and uh, many Northeast and uh, the Southwest area, because these mm -hmm. are the two areas where uh, you see uh, the, the big cluster of biotech companies. And um, since there are many companies that have been working in the field of life science tools in the past, uh, thereby previously, um, there they, they are companies that are kind of doing this part of work already. So uh, we, we had a good list to start from and to talk to in the beginning, and that really made things easier. We're gonna, let's carry on talking about uh, staffing and team at the moment as we've got to this topic so far. So talk to me, I've seen, um, on your website and on your LinkedIn, uh, you've got 
Wait, one second. Oh, perfect. Um, on your website and on your LinkedIn at the moment, you've got a huge amount of um, vacancies available. What I'm guessing you've got a lots of um, maybe bigger projects coming up. You're expanding at a fast rate. Tell me about that at the moment. I think one of the quite exciting things about um, what Western is doing is that the field uh, spatial genomics is really booming and we see almost exponential growth of say research publications in this field and uh, th this was not the case say about five years ago actually uh, if we look back say five or seven years ago the field of spatial genomics was not very very uh, well, well defined and it's only in recent years that people realize that um, they really need this kind of tool and that's partially why this is so exciting um, and in order to support this kind of activities and to deliver a product that can meet the market demand. Indeed, there are many uh, lines of products or features that we need to work on and improve um, uh, as well as sort of uh, also watch for the next generation of products as well, right? Um, so for us, um, we last year, we actually did our uh, soft announce. We, we delivered our pro product in a relatively short am uh, amount of turnaround time. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2021, in the summer, we did the soft launch and then Earlier in January, we did a full US launch, and now the product is fully available globally now. Um, so as you can see that there are a lot of activities going on, not only from the R&D side, uh, also from the operations and manufacturing side, we need to be able to scale up to support the yeah. uh, global demand of the instrument, right? Uh, but at the same time to sort of support, it also means that they need to be commercial presence in not only in the US now, but also uh, globally. So uh, with all those activities go going on, so that's why there are so many, um, as, as you hinted, um, so many sort of opportunities uh, now to uh, work in this space. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Let me, I'm going to stay on this a second and then I'm going to come back to something you just said. So um, talk to me about the challenges which you're currently facing with hiring that many people at one time. What are the challenges to find the correct fit uh, for Visgem? Yeah, I, I think one of the things um, that um, is we are very fortunate is that while, while the uh, market is still quite competitive in the biotech space, we are quite fortunate to really have a solid network in place already. Uh, uh, and we were able to hire and bring in uh, quite a bit of uh, talents to really meet our needs. And another thing that really made it easier for us is that our recent fundraising of Series C, uh, we raised uh, 85.2 million uh, US dollars. Uh, this is sort of a testament to the potential of technology and uh, it needs to a lot of interest uh, in our company for sure. Um, so in terms of, I, I'd say, sort of the bringing the right talent and bringing the right team, I, I think as the company grows and um, not only we have the uh, members in the US, but also um, members from uh, different countries now, sort of different countries will have different work culture uh, yeah. and they have different market need. And these are the new things that uh, as the company that uh, and as a team that we are also sort of very rapidly in learning and adopt and uh, adapt as well. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things, how do you manage a distributed, worldly, uh, globally distributed team? It's a very difficult challenge to, to tackle. But yeah, as, I mean, it's trial and error most of the time, isn't it? You don't know until you start. Um, tell me, uh, you spoke a little bit about funding there. Um, so recently you've announced that you've gave the 80, uh, 85, million, uh, 85 million dollars, I think you said, yeah, on Series C funding. Tell me the difference inexperience that you had from the first A and Series B. How was Series C different? Yeah, um, so um, I, I can touch base of sort of our history of fundraising. Uh, we raised uh, Series A back in uh, end of 2019. So that was 14 million US dollars. And then last year, uh, around April, we closed Series B fundraising. Um, that's $37 million. And then earlier in May this year, uh, we finished Series C. Um, so uh, this is sort of a quite rapid turnaround time for us to get this amount of money to deliver the products, which uh, really, I think, speaks for not only the interest from the VCs, but also uh, I think the excitement people are seeing for this field because spatial genomics, everyone says that this is the hottest field in uh, genomics research. So when we started back in 2000. 19 or actually end of 2018 when we were looking for funds to establish the company it was i'd say uh much 
much more tougher because at the time people didn't really know what we're working on or what this kind of technology is capable of. And as mentioned, uh, the field of spatial genomics was just forming and th there is not too much known about how different researchers or different academic institutions may even use our technology. So Series A, it, took, it indeed took us quite a while to uh, get to the stage, uh, but we were very fortunate to sort of find the right partner and the right uh, investors to support us along. And then when we get to Series B, things I think is a much different pace because not only we had a sort of prototype and better instrument already ready to go, but we also announced several, uh, I'd say, quite uh, important milestones and programs to sort of make different researchers and customers not only test, but also sort of run experiment on their own. Um, for example, we did a early access program, uh, we did data release program and better testing program with our instrument so that several key opinion leaders um, in the US, including the Chen Zuckerberg um, Biohub, CD Biohub and Rockefeller University, they were among those uh, that are sort of um, early accessors um, to our platform technology. And by building the, uh, uh, I said by building that group of customers that are very high profile, very prestigious universities, really speaking for the potential of the technology, it made it much simpler for other labs or other researchers to now start to use the technology. And, uh, and then Series B then was uh, much faster and, um, uh, and it's also very oversubscribed. We in the end had to sort of limit the amount of uh, investors um, uh, uh, since there was just so much interest. Mm -hmm. And getting to Series C, I think it's also a very similar trend. Um, and it also really speaks for the potential for the technology because I think if you look at the global stock market now, uh, for the past year, a half a year or so, uh, there's a downtrend that we're seeing, right? But being able to raise so much money uh, in such a, a current public market, I think truly speaks for the excitement people are seeing for our technology and for the potential of this company. Tell me there, um, obviously lots of experience from doing it now from A, B, and C, but what would be that one bit of advice you can give the other founders listening to this podcast for fundraising, what did you know, what do you know now at C that you didn't really know at A? Yeah, um, I, I think I, I'd like to quote one of the things that our uh, current uh, uh, CEO Terry Noh, uh, who um, I, I think speaks very well on this point of what really makes a successful company, and he often uses the four pillars uh, to the success of a, a good team or a good company, uh, mm -hmm. which includes a really unique and powerful technology, uh, a robust product. And then the third one is the right timing and a strong team. And I think Western is really fortunate to have all these four pillars uh, available for us to sort of really draw cards from. And that's why we were able to deliver the first product, the Merciful platform in such short turnaround time, uh, which is within less than two years, uh, which is really unprecedented in our uh, industry. Um, and that I think kind of is something that I think for anyone who's thinking of starting companies or thinking of like building companies, uh, evaluating these four big pillars uh, and make sure they're in place before the start is quite important, I'd, I'd say. Tell me, um, you were saying earlier, um, five, seven years ago, there wasn't this interest, yeah, that like there is now. What changed? Was it like the technology has changed to make it easier now? Or is it just something has changed in life to make people more interested? What has been that factor? Um, I think this is sort of an evolution of a research field that we've seen, uh, but um, I, I just say that there is one big uh, propelling factor of uh, why now uh, people are really considering spatial genomics to be a big one. So one of the things is that this is, a, as I mentioned, this is a natural evolution of a research field that was because, say, five or ten years ago, there was a big push of technology called single cell sequencing. Mm -hmm. um, Basically, researchers will be able to isolate individual cells, sequence the genome and the gene expression within individual cells so that they can figure out the identity of each individual cells with the type of single cell sequencing technologies. It put many researchers to a point where they will be able to know what those cells are, but then the napkin, the final piece, which is where those things are in a biological tissue or organ, they're really looking for that kind of um, technologies to meet the uh, final, to, to, to basically assemble the final pixel puzzle um, here, right? 
And then the technology of Murphy's um, really came along and that made it possible. So back in 2020, I think this is a point where um, Nature magazine uh, highlighted spatially resolved spatial transcriptomics as the method of the year. But this is a really, really influential um, uh, statement uh, because it really signifies how important these technologies and how breakthrough the technologies and Murphish was fortunate to be selected and highlighted in uh, in, in that journal's uh, comment. Mm -hmm. And that really made it, I, I, I'd say, widely sort of appreciated and recognized by the researcher in the field um, because not only this technology is sort of being described and used by some labs, but now being recognized by many more leading researchers and uh, leading you know, and very prestigious scientific journals as well. And that endorsement, I think, sort of makes it so much easier for us to uh, sort of talk to customers and highlight the strength and uh, the potential of the technology. Um, I, I, I put that particular one, the highlight of nature uh, as method of the year um, mm. to be a quite critical one. Mm, I actually read uh, before when I was doing some research about your company, I read um, there was actually a few articles kind of coining uh, your company as the lab, the, uh, the lab of the future. Yeah, the lab of the future. What have you done specifically? Like what is the um, key to your success to get so much traction and be called, be coined the lab of the future? Uh, I think in a field where everything is growing uh, and everything's getting established, uh, I think one of the crucial factors is sort of try to be the pioneer and set up standard. And uh, I think, especially for a new market where things are just getting established, it is important to sort of establish the so-called standard for this type of research, right? That we come now with a great product, but people may not necessarily even know how to look at the data and visualize the data or analyze the amount of data that they get from uh, our platform. So what we really ended up doing and prioritized a lot in the beginning was to sort of focus on developing the right metrics to really educate the market so that they know what they should be looking for and what kind of features might be most relevant uh, by using this tool. And then the, I think the last important one is sort of to expand the applications because it is a cool technology, but what is the killer app? Um, in, in, in research, right? Uh, we, we need to sort of really define that and really educate the customers and particularly researchers how to use the technology. Uh, so two of the major application areas that we're focusing on, um, among many others, uh, is for example, neuroscience and then oncology. We have got a lot of attraction and attention from uh, neuroscientists and oncologists that they are interested in using our platform to not only say, analyze the cellular composition of the brain, uh, not only in mouse, in human, uh, in oncology settings, people are interested in understanding all the different cells in play and how different drug treatment affects the cellular composition in tumor and such, right? And by establishing and educating the customers and really building stories, success stories, to show that by using this technology, you can get, gather new biological information or new findings that you can never get before. I think it's a very powerful way of sort of showing the potential of our technology. And that I think is one of the key things that sort of also differs us from many others that are still upcoming because we have a long track history of publications and success stories of how different users use this technology already. Mm, you actually answered one of my next questions there. So I was gonna ask about what differs you. So that, that is good. So we don't have to go through this one, but um, what I wanna know next is, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges. So yeah, we've touched on it a little bit, but before we do, talk to me about Murphish and Merscope. As I uh, understand, Murphish was first, Merscope came second. Um, talk to me about these two. Um, so Murphish was the foundational technology of Merscope platform. So uh, as a synchronous name wise, uh, I can briefly explain what Murphish stands for. It's a uh, multiplexed Aero robust fluorescence in situ hybridization technology. It's a lot of big words uh, all together. And um, essentially this is a technology where uh, researchers will be able to see different RNA molecules um, in situ, or uh, basically in, in biological tissue. And what we built up on is that we are trying to com come up with an all-in-one solution, basically uh, to enable researchers who wanted to run Murphy's experiment on the arm. So Merscope is a platform that combines the upstream, not only helping researchers designing the gene panels 
to uh, provide the right chemistry to process the samples to downstream automatic imaging acquisition so that researchers have very minimal interaction with the instrument. They basically can do a touch and then they can walk away. Mm -hmm. And then downstream, we also provide software tools so that they will be able to interactively explore the data, right? So you can see that we built the platform, we built Mersco based on a technology called Murfish, but then we're providing an all-in-one solution to our customers so that they really have much easier and, um, I'd say much more convenient way nowadays to operate and perform Murphy's experiment. Tell me the challenges that come, tell me the tech challenges there that come with making something so complex, relatively simple for people to use. Yeah, I think for um, the technology wise, um, one of the things that as, uh, as I previously hinted to was that um, this is a quite well established and validated technologies to make publications, right? And to make it easier for us or for our customer to use. So we do have certain uh, design criteria that were put in place, but to really simplify that, it's sort of really take those things into consideration and build the right tools to support. Um, for example, uh, one of the things about this platform is that it is a high resolution uh, microscope system. So uh, uh, if we are talking about microscope system, people usually need to put a sample on a microscope, put it on a stage, and then they need to find the focus, and then they need to turn on the right laser, they need to uh, actually find the right focal plan to image, and then they may need to even tune the exposure time. A lot of things need to be in place in order to acquire high resolution uh, fluorescence microscopy image, right? So when we First, sort of thought of this problem, we thought we, we need to simplify it. Uh, otherwise, many people who may not have the microscope experience, they may have difficulty of actually operating on the system. Thereby, with that design principle in our mind, we decided to really sort of simplify the process and have the machine or the software basically uh, take as much control as possible. And now, as you can see from the Merciful platform, all those are actually automatic process that basically once the end user put the sample on the machine by just a touch screen, you hit a start, mm -hmm. then the machine started to actually automatically scan the tissue. It automatically focuses, automatically sets the right laser power um, and, and settings so that you, you don't really have to spend that much time operating anymore. Mm -hmm. With that then, does that, I mean, this is just comes to me now, but does that, um, for example, is it more reliable than a human doing it then, going through for all of these kind of processes to find the results, maybe human error? Is it more reliable that way, or does it come with some kind of in, um, unreliable opportunities when it's through technology? Does technology provide more of the reliability or less in that sense? I think it definitely makes it makes it uh, much more robust and reproducible because the human errors when operating on the systems and mm -hmm. especially for uh, users, for example, who may not have the right training or expertise in imaging and fluidics before, it makes things much simpler. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I think made this possible is that we had as little interaction point on the instrument as possible um, because if you had to interact with the platform or with the instrument for too many times, the chances of introducing errors are much higher, right? So by simplifying this process and reducing the interaction points, it made things much simpler. And then the second thing is that we also build in a lot of feedback mechanisms to inform, for example, if there's anything wrong or not, because essentially, as you mentioned, we, we need to make sure that we, the machine is reliable thereby we need to build mechanisms to tell that it is doing the thing that we hope it to do. Mm -hmm. So it does have a lot of feedback mechanisms and report real-time report to inform each step is working properly. How long did it take to build uh, the machine machinery behind it, the tech side behind it? So from taking our prototype to uh, the commercial instrument, it, takes us roughly about a year or so. Uh -huh. Okay, wow, wow, a lot of work there's still into this then. Um, okay, let's go on to the future. Let's speak a little bit about the future. What do you think the future, two years from now, 
what do you think the future trend is going to be in the industry now, two years from now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for now, uh, spatial genomics is one of the hottest field in the genomics research, and we see a tremendous amount of opportunities here. Um, and nowadays, with the ability to basically see the transcript on the gene expression level, th there is already a lot of things that we can do. And um, for us, Wisdom as a company, I, I think it's very fortunate to be the really the, the leader in this market. Um, and as we look into the future and where the market is really heading to, I think one of the things that we always keep in mind and hear from customers is that they're looking for the next frontier of technologies. Uh, we started to hear more and more researchers talking about, uh, for example, so-called spatial genomics measurement, combining genomics, proteomics, and epigenome measurements. Uh, what this really means, this big words means is that they were, they're looking for all-in-one technology that not only measures the, uh, the RNA, the gene, they also look for things that are measuring the proteins, they're looking for things that measuring the epigenetic mod modification mm -hmm. in a biological sample. So basically different uh, analyze in one essay so that researchers will be able to get all the information with a single round uh, of experiment. They don't need to repeat the experiment anymore, which I think is one of the pain points for many biological researchers. Mm. And the second, I think, big trend that we are seeing um, and we hear a lot is actually extending the application from uh, non-clinical samples to clinical samples. Uh, this is really a big trend because most clinical samples are prepared in a way called hormone fixed and paraffin embedded samples, basically a wax type of sample, like the, the biological specimen is locked in a wax. So in order for researchers to unlock the bio biology insights in that waxy tissue, they need a method to be able to image and process the FFP samples. Uh, which was historically very, very, very challenging because everything is like, you know, wax, you need to de-wax mm -hmm. and then you need to have pro being able to bind. And as a company, we is actually releasing our FFP sample prep kits um, later in the year as we announced at, at AGBT uh, earlier uh, in June. So we're quite excited to make it possible to sort of provide new applications and new products to unlock different fields as well. And, and I just say, this is these two trends, like, more by analyze and more sample and application errors are two of the ones that we hear a lot these days. With regards to uh, you, with regards to your personal future, not your personal, but Vizgen's uh, personal future, what is the short term goal? What is the long term goal? Yeah, I think for the short term goal wise, uh, for us. Continue to really advance the technology and uh, to be able to really not only meet the market need for all kinds of spatial biology measurement and, uh, and continue to deliver the right products uh, mm -hmm. to the researchers. And I think long term goal wise for us, one of the big visions is really to use this technology to uh, advance human health, right? Um, so uh, just to think of the potential of this technology, we have a tool that is able to sort of tell where genes are, where cells are. We're basically building a tool that can almost like a Google map of the human body. And by building this kind of references, with, um, cell atlases of the human body, then in the future, imagine that if a patient, the cells and the genes are altered in some way, now you can compare with that reference map to mm -hmm. the diseased state. And that could start to really inform a lot of um, things that we currently cannot imagine, for example, the state of the disease, the therapeutic treatment options, and how to certify patients and such, right? And we can also even potentially monitor drug response as well. So there's a huge potential for this technology in the future. And that's why we're sort of really building the foundation now with the technology first to sort of really create this type of cell atlas and Google map of the human body and building the reference map. And with that map, going into the future, there's a lot more potential that we can see um, for, um, for disease and for um, disease diagnostic as, as well as drug uh, development. Hey guys, it's me again. If you enjoyed this episode of the show, be sure to press the thumbs up button below. And also while you're there, hit subscribe. Otherwise you could miss out on all of our interesting content we've got coming your way in the near future. Okay guys. Take care and see you soon.